So we've already gone over a whole bunch of bacteria that can cause disease. We've gone over a whole bunch of viruses with DNA that can cause disease. And now we're going to go over a whole bunch of more viruses that can cause disease, except all of these viruses contain RNA as their main genetic material. And as I just said, there are quite a few RNA viruses. So it's a very diverse group of microbes, and there are a lot of these viruses. And so we group them and divide them up into different families. It's based on whether they have an envelope or a non-envelope, they're the naked viruses, whether they have a single strand of RNA um, or one group that even has a double strand of RNA. And then of the single-stranded RNA, there are some differences. They could have that positive single strand or the negative single-stranded RNA. And so I'm like, there's, and then there's even a group that has an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So a lot of different ways we can group these and organize them and divide them up. Now, I like this particular diagram. I like to color code things, but it's going to go over some of the big families and, you know, the big div dividers and then some of the families that are found in each of these big groups. So the first group we're going to talk about, we're going to start on the top left up here. and We are going to work our way around. So we're going to start with our first group, all in the red. These, all of these viruses have an envelope. Their RNA is segmented, so it's not one long strand of RNA. And they have the negative sense of single-stranded RNA. So for them to replicate, they have to first make the positive strand to be able to do that. And of these families, in, the, uh, in this group is where we find the families, the orthomixaviridae, the bunyaviridae, and the arenaviridae groups. Now, the orthomixaviridae group is the group where we find our flu viruses. So there are several strains of flu viruses, but most often people think of the orthomixaviridae group when they hear of the flus. The other two groups are the Bunyaviridae and Arenaviridae group. Now, most of the viruses, but not all, of the viruses in the Bunyaviridae and the Arenaviridae are animal viruses. And we pick them up because we have contact with infected animals. Now, not all of them are spread by humans, but a lot of them are in these two particular groups. But we're going to start talking first about the Orthomixaviridae group, the flu virus. It causes influenza. We just shorten it to the flu. This particular virus, it targets the cells of the respiratory tract. Its job, it wants to get into those cells of the respiratory tract. It wants to reproduce. And then it's going to go leave to find more cells of the respiratory tract. But when it does that, as it's reproducing and then leaving, it does cause damage to cells. Now, it's that damage to cells in the respiratory tract is where we get a lot of our symptoms of the flu. And because the cells that line our respiratory tract are part of our first line of defense, preventing other organisms from getting in the body, when we lose that first line of defense, it opens up us to a whole slew of secondary infections that we could possibly pick up. Now, the structure of the flu it in itself does kind of tell a little story on how the flu virus develops into so many different flu strains. Now, the actual genome, the RNA, is made up of eight segments. The outside of the flu virus has two specific glycoproteins structures on the outside. I don't or too much that you know the full names of them. It's just as long as you're familiar with the NA and the HA of the glycoproteins. On the diagram, all the HAs are the light blue and all of the darker blues are the NAs. Now, if you notice, just on this one particular picture, there's almost a pattern of a three to one ratio. It's not exact, it varies a little bit, but that in itself is where the variability of the flu strains comes about. Any variation in the quantity and arrangement of NAs and HAs on the surface of this particular virus means it's a completely different flu strain. So any variation whatsoever 
So if we have a three to one ratio and then it's now a two to one or a three to two to one to three to two to one, you know, any combination, any variability, then we have a whole new flu virus. Now, because it's constantly changing, this variability, it's where what's what we call is antigenic drift. Again, I like to think about it is that this virus is kind of drifting along, changing a little bit. And again, any change in its genetic material at that outside surface, which is derived, derived from the genetic material, is a change in the virus itself. So that's antigenic drift. And it's antigenic drift that is the reason that you need a flu vaccine every single year. Is there's, been, there's new strains, there's new variability in the NAs and HAs on the surface. So the CDC and the World Health Organization, they do track the trends. You know, do the new strains seem to be getting more NAs or HAs, or we're starting to see more variation of a 3 to 1 or 2 to 1? They're, they're tracking trends, and they're making estimates, guesstimates, on where they see those trends coming out into the next flu season, and then they develop vaccines for that. Now, they're not always correct when they develop those flu vaccines. Again, they're making educated guesses on where those trends are going to end up, and I'm like, sometimes they're very accurate, sometimes they're not. But the good thing is, is even if it's not exactly correct, the fact is when you get a flu vaccine, you are still injecting some of the genetic material, some of the NAs and HAs, even if not in the correct order. And your body, your immune system starts to recognize some of the antigens for the virus. Even if it's not the correct flu strain, it recognizes some of it. And because it can recognize some of it, it can lessen the effects, all your symptoms of developing the flu. So people that get the flu after getting the flu vaccine generally have it for a shorter period of time and usually have less severe symptoms just because your immune system is already slightly ready for it, even if it's not the exact same strain. So that's antigenic drift, that constant slight change all the time. Now, antigenic shift is a little bit different. This is when you have two different viruses. And a lot of times it's a flu virus that infects humans and a flu virus that infects animals. When you have two completely different flu viruses that mix together and make a brand new virus. So it's not a change in a virus. It's a recombination of genetic material from two different viruses to create a new virus. Now, I like this picture, and I like how books color code, color code things, too. So this is antigenic drift, that when a flu virus gets inside of a cell, it slightly changes. So what goes in is more of a teal color. What comes out is more of a blue color. It's a slight change. Now, this does mean that when you get the flu, someone coughed on you and gave you the flu, the flu virus that went in you, what flu virus that you're shedding to other people could be slightly different. So this is where you get iffy is, you know, the more people that get the flu, the more opportunity for change to occur and end up with new flu strains. Now, antigenic shift is taking two different strains of the flu. They both go into the same host. The genetic makeup, the RNA, recombines, and what comes out is a completely new flu. Now, I like when the book puts... A red and a blue, they combine together, and what comes out is purple. Now, an interesting note about antigenic shift is we're not completely sure why, but it seems that antigenic shift seems to happen about every 10 years. I mean, there's always some change that's happening, but about every 10 years, we seem to get an outbreak of some type of flu strain. Now, and I'm like, this is kind of showing we had bird flu, swine flu. And I'm like, we're not sure why it's every 10 years we seem to be getting a new strain. But it seems to happen um, in the 10-year cycles. And I, I should note that we're about due for another flu strain. You know, on top of COVID, because COVID is not a flu, but another flu strain 
were due. This is just showing another example of how that antigenic shift takes place when you take two flu viruses, one could be from an animal, the duck flu, and one could be from humans, mix them together and you get a completely new strain and your body can't recognize it because it's a completely new strain. And since they can't recognize it, you end up suffering severe, possibly severe complications from it. Now, of the human flu viruses, there really are three main types of flu strains. The influenza A, B, and C. Influenza A is the most virulent, so it's the most able to cause disease. After about 2003, the strains of the influenza A, there was a bunch that infected birds and then went through an antigenic shift, which then began to infect humans. And so we started to get the bird flu. And again, it's known for influenza A strains are known for being the strains that can mix with animals to cause more deadly flu strains for humans. Influenza B, it generally just undergoes antigenic drift. It's doing that kind of constant change all the time. So what goes in your cell is could be different than what comes out of the cell. It doesn't do a line of antigenic shift or recombinations with other animals. Now, when you have the flu symptoms and you get tested for the flu, they're generally looking to see if it's an influenza A or if it's an influenza B. They're testing for both of those. Influenza C, it is a flu strain, but it usually doesn't, it only causes some minor respiratory disease. So we're not all that concerned about influenza C strains. Because it's minor respiratory diseases, they're not usually involved in big, massive epidemics. So it's, you know, they're just really looking to see whether you have A or B. Now, influenza A, the more virulent strain, it's mostly, it's virulent because of how contagious it is. It's, you know, been known to cause pandemics. It's usually seasonal in the wintertime. And it's among the top 10 causes of death in the United States, especially among elderly and smaller children, those that have weaker immune system. And again, part of that is because it is binding to the cells of the respiratory system. It's destroying those cells of the respiratory system. And you lose that first line of defense. It can cause severe inflammation, which can cause issues all in itself with breathing if you've got inflammation in your respiratory tract. Other symptoms that it will cause, fever, headache, myalgia or muscle pain, pharyngeal pains, so you've got a sore throat, shortness of breath, coughing, and you know, because you lose that first line of defense, you are open to secondary infections. A lot of times bacterial infections. That includes pneumonia as well. And a lot of times it's the pneumonia that ends up killing patients. And the pneumonia is not caused from the influenza. It's caused by the destruction of the first line of defense leading to a secondary infection. Now, a couple of signs and symptoms that you may have realized that aren't up here that most of the time people associate with the flu are diarrhea and vomiting. Diarrhea and vomiting are not normal symptoms of the flu. The, the actual virus itself targets respiratory system. However, because of the destruction of the first line of defense, you are more likely to pick up a secondary infection. So if you have the flu and you have vir diarrhea and vomiting with it, well, lucky you, you are now suffering from the flu and something else some other type of bacteria, some other type of virus that's causing you to, to have that diarrhea and the vomiting along with it. So, yay, you get two in one. Now, diagnosing the flu, well, we do have immunofluorescent tests. They usually go up and get a pharyngeal or nasopharyngeal sample, so big, long swab way up in that nasopharyngeal region. They can also do an antibody antibody titer to see if your body is reacting to the flu virus because the flu virus is present. Now treatment. The sooner you can get diagnosed and start treatment, the better. We do have some antivirals on the market. You're more commonly known them as their common names, not the drug name itself of Tamiflu or Relenza. 
Now, these particular antivirals, they stop the spread of the virus from one cell to another. So if one cell has it, these particular antivirals is preventing that virus from getting out or getting into a new flu virus. So if you can take these at the onset of symptoms, you can really kind of stop that virus in its tracks. If, however, you have full-blown symptoms, these are not going to do anything. At this, at the, by the time you have full-blown symptoms, damage to your respiratory system is done, and you're waiting for your, resp your immune system to kick in. Now, like bacteria, viruses can develop resistance as well, and the flu virus is starting to develop resistance to some of our antivirals. Now, the best way you can prevent the flu is you can get an annual flu vaccine. Now, again, it's an annual one because they are constantly changing. But the more people that get it, the less opportunity the flu has from developing new strains through antigenic drift. So the more people that can get it, the less severe side effects you're going to have, the less opportunity for the virus to be able to change from when it goes into cells. And so, yes, and even if you do get it, you have less, less severe signs and symptoms. Highly recommended to get that flu vaccine every winter. Now, some other viruses that are in this group of enveloped negative sense single-stranded RNA are the bunya viruses and the arena viruses. These are generally transmitted zoonotically, so they go from animals to humans. Some of them can cause some epidemics, depending on which ones they are. They can be very dangerous. They are generally going to require those that work with them in labs to be wearing the full hazmat outfits. They are biosafety level number four. Now, the bunya viruses are transmitted generally by insects and ticks. Now, a couple of them that are found here in the United States, California encephalitis, Rift Valley fever, and lacrosse encephalitis. And yes, that's this lacrosse. This lacrosse. So, yay, we are in the textbooks, but not for any particular good reason. The fever that causes, the, fl the virus that causes lacrosse encephalitis was discovered. There was a young boy that had died. He was from lacrosse that had died, and they eventually were able to ID this particular virus as the cause of death. Because he was from lacrosse, it's now caused lacrosse encephalitis. So, yes, lacrosse is in the microbiology textbooks. Now, some other bunyavirus that is found in the America is called the hantavirus. The hantavirus is an emerging disease. We're seeing more and more cases of it. We still don't see a lot around here yet. Hopefully it stays that way. And it causes a condition known as the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. This virus targets the lungs. It causes a high fever. It can cause that fluid buildup in the lungs. It can cause full pulmonary fever. Failure, it has a 33% mortality rate. That's not great. Now, how it spread is it's a zoonotic. It's carried by deer and mice, and it's transmitted via airborne dried animal waste. So if there's feces from either deer or mice, and some of that feces gets dried, kicked up in the air, and you breathe it in, you could potentially pick up this particular virus. So if you have mice in your house, that does put you at a slightly higher risk of picking up this particular virus. But again, it is rare. There's only the very occasional cases here in Wisconsin and Minnesota. But I wanted to show you a couple. We're talking about the, the Bunya viridae group. And yes, there's our very own lacrosse encephalitis. Yay us. Now, an arena virus... Unlike some of them are a little more deadly than others, there's not a lot of arena viruses around here in the United States. They're mostly if you travel somewhere in either Africa or South America. But some of the diseases that the arena viruses can cause is Lassa fever, Argentine hemorrhagic fever, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, and what's known as lymphocytic choriomeningitis. Most of them are associated with rodents. And rodents then can also spread them to dogs. 
And if we are anywhere near where there are dogs and rodents and where those two animals can connect to each other, it puts us at a higher risk because it can get spread from contact with rodents. And although you might not have a lot of contact with rodents, you might have a lot of contact with dogs. And it's transmitted through aerosols or contact with the infected animal. Now, again, we don't have these here in the United States. It's mostly if you are traveling. So if you're traveling somewhere and you see a dog and you're like, oh, what a cute dog. Well, just, you know, be a little worried, you know, a little wary if you don't know where that dog's been. You don't know if the virus is rampant in that particular area. You don't know if it's had contact with rodents. You know, just be a little wary if you're traveling. Now, another arena virus that is not spread with animals, it's not a zoonotic virus, is the hepatitis D virus but it's still in the group based on its genetics and its structure. Now, the hepatitis virus is spread through bodily fluids, sexual contact, and contaminated needles are the top ways that it's spread. The interesting part about hepatitis D is that hepatitis D requires hepatitis B virus to replicate. Hepatitis D virus cannot hijack our cells and make our cells replicate and make more hepatitis D. It needs hepatitis B to do that. It's almost like it's missing a key component that hepatitis B can give it. Now, because it's a hepatitis virus, it's got that word hepat in it, meaning it does target liver cells. And so it can cause inflammation of the liver. And anytime you have any kind of inflammation, it can cause some damage, which puts you at a higher risk of developing liver cancer. Now we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a vaccine against hepatitis D. However, we do have a vaccine against hepatitis B. So when you get vaccinated for hepatitis B, you actually are vaccinated against hepatitis D as well. So one vaccine that actually is vaccinated against two different viruses. Now our first concept check on here is which of these happens in the case of antigenic shift in influenza A? And the one, you know, the which one that happens with influenza A when you have antigenic shift. Antigenic shift is that recombination of the RNA segments between bird or another animal and human strains. Now, we're going to move our way down to our enveloped negative sense single-stranded RNA. And all of the genetic material is one single strand. So up here, the information was segmented. Now it's all going to be one single strand. And on here, we've got a really big paramyx of viridae group. We have a rabda viridae group and a philo viridae group. So a really big paramyx of viridae group. Now all of the viruses, and there are like three groups under this group, all of the viruses in this particular group all cause cells, the infected cells, to fuse together into one big cell. And that big, huge kind of conglomerate of few cells is called a syncytia. And so when you start to have all of these infected cells all fusing together, that's a syncytia. It is great for the virus because it can easily move around from one cell area to another and replicate and cause lots of viruses in one area. Now, the three groups, kind of subgroups in here, are the paramyxa viruses, which kind of sounds like the family name, the measles viruses, and the pneumoviruses. But also in our enveloped, unsegmented, negative sense, single-stranded RNAs, the rabdiviridae and the filoviridae group as well. But we're going to start up here with our paramyxa viruses. Now, there are two. There's the parainfluenza, and there's also mumps in our paramyxa viruses. The parainfluenza virus is, you know, it's just as widespread as the actual influenza virus itself, but it's not as severe. So they gave it the name parainfluenza. It's like it's it's like influenza, but just like influenza. Para, para kind of means it's similar. It's around, the, you know, around the type of symptoms that the flu has but it's more benign. It usually doesn't have as severe side effects. It is spread by respiratory transmission, so coughing, sneezing, things like that. It's mostly seen in children, 
kids suffer the most severe side effects, even though they're not always that severe. Um, the ones that usually are going to suffer the worst side effects are usually our infants and newborns. But it can cause just minor cold symptoms. It can cause bronchitis. It can cause a bronchopneumonia, and it can develop into something known as croup. Now, there are four types of parainfluenza viruses. They just call them one, two, three, and four. They're either going to target the upper respiratory tract or they're going to target the lower respiratory tract. And a lot of it, they're going to cause the inflammation somewhere in the respiratory tract. Now, when it causes croup, it is causing inflammation of the upper respiratory tract. So anywhere around the trachea and the larynx. And when you have inflammation in the trachea and the larynx, it causes some noisy breathing, labored breathing, more of a hoarse sounding cough. And the cough itself, they say that it has a seal bark type of sound to it. So if you've ever gone to a zoo and or like a sea world type of show and you have seen the seals you saw some type of seal show it if you know what a seal sounds like when it talks they call it a bark croup has that similar symptom so here's the sound of a boy that has croup and i can truly picture a seal at one of these animal shows making this particular noise <coughs> It's a very noisy, very kind of deep sounding cough. That's all because of the inflammation anywhere around the larynx. Now, mo there really is no specific treatment. Most are going to recover without any long lasting issues. Most of the time, the treatment is just supportive therapy. So if there's inflammation, take an anti-inflammatory. If there's congestion, take a decongestion. It's just supportive, making you comfortable as your immune system gets rid of this particular virus. Now, the other virus that's in this the paramyx of virus group is the mumps. The mumps targets the parotid salivary gland, the one that's kind of up in that upper cheek back by the ear, and it causes very painful swelling of the salivary gland. Sometimes it happens on one side only. Sometimes it happens on both of the salivary glands at the same time, but it's called epidemic Parotitis, that's that inflammation of the parotid salivary gland. Now, humans are the only reservoir for the mumps virus. You can't find it in any animal. We're the only ones that can harbor it and spread it. Now, 40% of infections are subclinical, which means you might not have any signs and symptoms, which means you could be spreading out without having any idea. The good news is if you've ever had mumps, you do develop a long-term immunity to it. So if you have mumps, you're not likely to get it again. Now, we don't have a lot of cases here in the United States. On average, around 300 cases in the whole United States in a full year. And that's because we do have a vaccine for it. We developed the vaccine in the late 1960s. And yes, as soon as we vaccinated, the number went way down. It is part of the MMR vaccine, which stands for measles, mumps, and rubella. We'll get to measles and rubella. Still coming up. If someone did, if you, know, if you didn't get vaccinated or the vaccine itself wasn't effective for you, not everyone has an effective reaction to a vaccine, it's about two to three weeks after you get that virus in the body that you're going to start to develop some of the symptoms of mumps. And that's fever, muscle pain, tired, that swelling of the cheeks, and it can cause deafness. And that deafness is because of the inflammation in that parotid salivary gland that's up near the eardrums. And so it can cause damage to the eardrums that can cause possible deafness. Now, it was just a few years ago that in La Crosse, at UW-La Crosse, they did have three cases of mumps. They were individuals. They went home for spring break. They picked it up somewhere, brought it back. I believe all three of them were vaccinated against it. My note, though, that the vaccine effectiveness is around 85 to 90%. It's a pretty effective vaccine. 
Well, these three were unfortunately in that 10 to 15% group that they were exposed to the virus and the vaccine didn't work for them. The hope is that if we get enough people vaccinated, that even if you were the unlucky 10%, if no one around you has it, there's no way you can get it either. It's called your herd immunity. If we can get enough people vaccinated, even if you're not vaccinated or if you're in the unlucky 10% where it didn't work, if there's no virus anywhere, <laughs> you can't get it. We're going to move into kind of our next group. It's the paramyxoviridae group. It's just not a paramyxovirus. And in the paramyxoviridae group, because there were threes, the paramyxoviruses, the measles virus, and the pneumovirus. In our paramyxoviridae group, the measles virus is our second subgroup. Now, the measles virus is spread, humans only, they're the only carriers of it, in large, dense populations. It's very contagious. It's spread by respiratory droplets, so coughing, sneezing, even talking can spread this particular virus. And it first gets in and targets the respiratory tract, and then it spreads throughout the entire body. Now, it's usually about a week after picking up this particular virus where you start to develop some of the initial symptoms a dry, unproductive cough, headache, fever, conjunctivitis or pink eye. You may develop an ear or sinus infection, but then as it starts to spread, the, spread throughout the body, it can develop into a widespread rash. One unique symptom that this particular virus causes is something known as a coplic spot. These are white spots on the inside of the mouth, on the gums, and just on the inside mucosal lining inside your cheeks. So if you can pull down your lips and look in the cheeks, you end up with these white spots. They usually have a little bit of red inflammation around them. They say it's a little red halo around it, but those are one of the diagnostic tools that they even use to diagnose measles is, oh, you have a fever, you've got possibly pink eye, you're tired. Um, a cough, and ah, you have the white spots, and you've got that rash on the body. This particular virus can cause some rare complications. It can cause pneumonia. It can cause encephalitis. It can cause something known as subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a mouthful to say. But the subacute sclerosing panencephalitis is a degeneration of neurological tissue, so it's damage to the brain tissue. And this causes about one case in a million. So again, it's rare, but it is deadly. So this is a virus that is known to kill. It may kill because of encephalitis. It may cause kill because of pneumonia, but it may also kill you because of the subacute sclerosing panencephalitis. One way to prevent it is get vaccinated because it's part of that MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, and rubella. And we're still coming up on rubella coming up. Since we developed a vaccine, the number of cases went way down. However, what we're starting to see now is the number of cases that have started to increase. And that's because people are choosing not to vaccinate, which means we don't have herd immunity. And we're starting to see large groups of unvaccinated individuals spreading this particular virus. Again, it's usually diagnosed just by signs and symptoms, treatment, we don't have any universal treatment. We do know that some vitamin A injections at the early onset of symptoms seem to decrease how long you have the symptoms, but mostly it's just over-the-counter treating the, the symptoms and making you comfortable. But again, best prevention is we can get vaccinated. My note uh, that I have on there, that huge spike, and the reason why I had this particular picture is that it was the winter of 2014-2015 that there was a huge outbreak of measles. Right there, huge outbreak of measles that was tied back to Disneyland. So that happiest place on earth ended up being not so happy for a lot of individuals because they developed measles when they were there. Again, you have a large, dense population of people and from all walks of life, some choose not to vaccinate, some choose to, but you have a large, dense population that are spreading lots of possible viruses. As I say, this is just showing that we're, you know, areas that are in that teal or lighter colored means we're not vaccinating enough. 
that makes this that we're not we don't have the herd immunity because just we're not vaccinating enough. We don't have a high enough percent of the vaccination to say we have herd immunity here. But it was, you know, a few years ago, Disneyland was not the last outbreak of measles. The last outbreak happened in the fall of 2018. Um, and kind of, the, well, kind of the whole year of 2018, all the way spring, summer, and into the fall, that there was an outbreak, that we had just cases everywhere. We were getting to the point that we were stopping people from going to certain areas if they could prove they weren't vaccinated is because they might be spreading this particular virus. Now that might sound similar, preventing people going somewhere may sound a little bit like COVID. However, the big difference is, is that measles has a vaccine. It's just people were choosing not to vaccinate. Now, our last group of our paramyxoviridae groups, or last, our third subgroup, is the respiratory syncytial virus, also known as the pneumovirus. It infects the respiratory tract, the upper respiratory tract, and produces that fused cell syncytia. Older children and adults generally are asymptomatic or suffer from very little. However, in children six months or younger, it can be a very fatal virus to acquire. And it's because of that damage to the respiratory tract on individuals that young. So it gets into the body through the nose or the eye. It replicates in the nasal pharynx. So, and it can cause fever, rhinitis, rhinitis, that's inflammation of the nose, inflammation of the pharynx. It can cause ear infections. It can cause croup type symptoms. But because of that syncytia, that fusing of the cells in the respiratory tract, it can be deadly for infants because the few cells in the respiratory tract means those cells can't do what they were supposed to, which is do gas exchange. And if you can't do gas exchange, you're not going to get enough oxygen for survival and it does become fatal. Treatment. We do have some antibodies that block attachment to cells. My note though, a lot of times it takes a while to even diagnose because infants can come in all the time with fevers, with you know inflammation of the pharynx, with ear infections. And most of the time they're just gonna you know, be like, oh yes, I see an ear infection. And they send to home with antibiotics and they don't, then they don't work. And now it's two weeks later. The sooner you can do treatment, the better. But a lot of times it's misdiagnosed or the diagnosis comes very late. And it's just because the symptoms at the onset can resemble other things. However, some of the treatments that, again, the sooner you can get them, the better, is an antibody that blocks the attachment to cells so that it can't be spreading. And we also have an inhaled antiviral drug that also prevents it from spreading. But again, a lot of times those are given too late and it's already spread and it's already caused too much damage to the respiratory tract. Now, our next group is our rabdiviridae group. Now, I like this group. It's just one that people probably know the rabdiviridae group, and that's because of the rabies virus that's found in this particular group, this family. It does have an envelope, but the capsid part of this virus is unique. It doesn't have an icosahedral shape. It has a bullet-shaped capsule or capsid. That's unique all in itself is to have a bullet-shaped capsid. Now, another unique this part of rabies is that it is very slow progressive disease, and it's spread by animals. So we pick it up with contact with infected animals. Now, the primary reservoirs are wild animals, but it can be spread by both wild and domestic animals by bite scratches or inhalation of droplets. So most of the time, you don't have a lot of contact with wild animals. But if you have a pet, if you have a cat, if you have a dog, and your pets get out and have contact with infected wild animals and then bring it into the house or into your environment, that's where more people pick it up. So most of the time, we pick it up by domestic animals or pets than we do from wild animals. And that's just because we don't have a lot of contact with wild animals. But I'll talk a little bit in coming up on why picking it up from your pets is still rare 
um, if you're a good pet owner. The main wild mammal in our area that harbors this particular virus is the skunk. There's my cute little skunks. You know, if they didn't spray, they'd actually be pretty darn cute. But the skunks is a big reservoir around here. When the virus gets into your body through a bite, uh, which is the most common way it gets in, it grows for weeks and multiplies slowly. This is not, you know, full-blown symptoms within a couple days. It can take quite a while. Eventually, after it starts to reproduce and spreads throughout the body, it gets into the nervous system. And then it eventually gets and spreads throughout your entire nervous system, all of your ganglia, spinal cord, brain. As it does spread throughout the body, it does like to get into the salivary gland and reproduce. And so you do have a high viral load in the salivary gland, which is why it's spread by bites, is that when an animal bites you, when they bite there, a lot of that saliva gets into the bite site and you end up with an infectious dose of virus. If you've got a, if you've ever been bitten by an animal, we're just going to say you haven't because we'll talk about why um, it's not good to get this particular virus. But if someone was bitten by an animal that had this particular virus, there are four phases that you will go through. The first phase is the prodromal phase. And this is when you start to develop flu-like symptoms. It's fever, nausea, vomiting, fatigue. Sometimes you have, you know, pain or burning sensation at the bite site. And a lot of times people don't even go to the doctor at this point. My only note, though, is by the time you have any of these symptoms and it's caused by the rabies virus, it's still too late for you, whether you went to the doctor or not. The interesting part is that because this is such a slow, progressive disease, you might not develop the prodromal phase for weeks, sometimes months. There's even been documented cases where it has been a year or two years after a bite where these initial symptoms developed. So weeks, if not months, before you even get to the prodromal phase. But by the time you get to the prodromal phase, it is too late for you. It's imminent death. By the time you have any symptoms of the rabies virus, it's imminent death. Once we've gotten over that, that part, it will develop into what's known as the furious phase. Which I just like the names of these phases. The furious phase, it's gonna, you're going to have agitation for no particular reason. You're just agitated all the time. You're disoriented, you can develop seizures, twitching, something known as hydrophobia. And this again is because it is affecting the nervous system. And the nervous system does control your skeletal muscles. And so this is when you're starting to get that twitching because you're losing control of the skeletal muscle. Now hydrophobia, everyone's always like, um, that means fear of water. It does mean fear of water. Now, people that have gotten into this furious phase, they're not running around screaming every time they see a puddle of water. They're not afraid of water. However, it can cause really painful swelling in the throat that it becomes very painful to swallow. And so animals have been known by the time they get to this phase that they stop drinking. Even humans, they stop drinking. At that point, you're on an IV. And it's just that pain with the swallowing. So they're not afraid of water, but they do stop drinking water. After the furious phase, you develop into what's known as the dumb phase. This again it is more damage to the nervous system, causing more damage also to the skeletal system. It can cause paralysis, disorientation, and stuporous, meaning kind of just walking around, you don't really know what's going on. And then it finally progresses to a coma phase resulting in death. Now again, by the time you have any symptoms of this virus, it is too late for you. It is, you know, again, it could be weeks though, sometimes months before you develop symptoms, but by the time you have symptoms, it is too late. For diagnosing this particular virus, it is usually diagnosed at autopsy. That, and again, is because by the time you have symptoms, it's too late. How they do a diagnosis at autopsy 
is they take some of your nervous tissue, a lot of times from the brain, they stain it and they're looking for these dark staining called negri bodies in your nervous tissue. That's just a con confirmative diagnosis after death. Now, managing rabies, because again, we'd prefer just to not get rabies. Now, we don't vaccinate humans for rabies. It's not one of your routine vaccines. We have vaccines, but it's not a routine vaccine. Instead, we vaccinate pets, because if your pet ever got out and interacted with a wild animal, they're the ones that would most likely be the ones that would bring it to you. So although we do have a higher risk of having pets of picking up rabies, if you get your pets vaccinated for rabies, that chance goes all the way down. So then you only have to worry about the wild animals. Now, if you do get bitten by a wild animal or bitten by an animal that hasn't been vaccinated for rabies, some of the things that they're going to do is you know clean the wound extremely well and then they're actually going to give you an antibody treatment right at that bite site then they're also going to vaccinate you so it's always let's do anything you know to try to prevent you from getting infected so that we don't ever develop signs and symptoms of the rabies virus now as i said before i'm like treatment they are going to give you antibody at the bite site and so they're going to give you a passive immunization. They're going to give you the antibodies to try to bind up the virus right there at the bite site where it's in highest concentration. They're also then going to give you the vaccine. So this is rare. You normally cannot get vaccinated after you've been exposed to something. It would be great if you could all the time. If you're like, oh, I was just hanging out with someone that had the flu. Maybe, you know, maybe I should now go get the flu, flu vaccine. Uh, that doesn't work. It's like if you've been exposed to it, you can't then go, to go get vaccinated for it. But this one you can. And it's only because this particular virus is so slow to replicate in the body that your immune system is faster than it. And so if you have been exposed to this particular virus that it's in the body, we can give someone the vaccine and their immune system will develop an immune response against the virus faster than the virus can replicate. You may have known someone that's had to have this vaccine. I haven't had it, but I've heard it's painful, but it's given in six doses with two additional boosters. Again, if you think you've ever been exposed to the rabies virus, don't wait for symptoms to appear. Get vaccinated, get that preventative vaccine. Now, our control to try to just prevent the vaccine or to prevent the virus from being around is vaccinating our pets, is getting rid of strays, bringing them into different types of humane societies, making sure they get vaccinated there, and then strict quarantine practices. So if an animal did bite someone, they will quarantine that animal to see if the animal develops any symptoms so that it's not out spreading it to other animals. They can go to doggy daycare after a bite just in case that it did have this particular virus. Now, I said before that you know, you shouldn't wait. If you think you've been exposed to this virus, go get vaccinated. Do not wait to see if you develop any signs and symptoms because by then it's too late. This virus has a 99.999% fatality rate. Can't say 100% because there's always that one case, that, that 0.001% case. Now, the interesting part, if you read the first sentence... A Wisconsin teenager, first human ever to survive rabies without the vaccine. Ever. And from Wisconsin. So that's awesome. Now, my just little backstory is that this particular girl, she had picked it up from the bite of a bat while at church. She developed the signs and symptoms. She didn't get vaccinated, you know, after that exposure. And so by then, it's, you know, you're looking at it's imminent death. There's nothing else about it. It's imminent death once you develop the signs and symptoms. So at that point, doctors really don't have anything to lose by trying new things. You know, like if it's imminent death. 
So they decided to try some new treatments out on her. The good thing is she lived. The bad thing is they tried so many different things. They're not exactly sure what is what caused her to survive. So they did put her into a coma. They gave her several different antiviral drugs. They lowered her body temperature and she eventually survived. They just unfortunately don't know. Was it the combination of drugs? Was it the coma they put her in? Was it the temperature that they had to lower? Was there something else that was going on that caused her to live? So they're not exactly sure, but they know she was able to survive. And the first ever to survive rabies without that vaccine after exposure. As individually, individuals in the United States are diagnosed with rabies, they are trying some of these different things that they gave this particular teenager. Now, she lived in a suburb of Milwaukee called Wauwatosa. Now, they didn't name the protocol on how she survived Wauwatosa. Instead, they called it the Milwaukee Protocol. And so the Milwaukee Protocol, so it's actually called that in hospitals all over the United States, is the Milwaukee Protocol, is that if there is a patient with rabies, they will start by, okay, well, let's lower the body temperature, possible coma, let's start them on these different types of antivirals. And again, trying to find something that worked. If it worked with one person, it might work with another. So kind of cool that that happened here in Wisconsin, and it's called the Milwaukee Protocol. So you might see that somewhere out, you know, later on in your field works. Now, another virus that's not great, that's also in the same group. It's the last of our subgroups is the filoviridae group. Now it's called philo because the virus itself is very long and they say it's long and filamentous. Sometimes it even kind of twists around on itself. And two viruses that are found in this subfamily are the Marburg viruses and the Ebola virus. They both cause human disease. They're unknown where the viruses came from. These things haven't been around for, you know, centuries. We know they've been around for decades and it's unknown exactly where they came from. We do know they're spread by contam- contaminated body fluids and syringes, and we know that this particular virus gets in and causes massive destruction to the liver. Now, because so much blood flows to the liver, that massive destruction to the liver causes internal bleeding, which can actually even lead to external bleeding. The initial symptoms after and exposure are fever, fatigue, and abdominal pain near where the liver is in the abdomen. If you're in an area in the world that is known for having this virus and you're starting to show those symptoms, you're going to be quarantined big time right away. Luckily, we have been developing some treatments just in the last five years. We've got some pretty good treatments that are coming out. They're not 100% whatsoever effective, but they are, you know, increasing survival rate because Marburg kills about 90% of those that pick it up and Ebola kills about 75%. So they're very deadly viruses. Most treatment has just been fluid replacement and hope. But just then again, the last few years, we've developed what are known as ZMAP antibodies. These are genetically engineered antibodies. We are not exposing anyone to these particular viruses and harboring these antibodies. These are genetically engineered antibodies, and they're having really good results. Again, they're not 100% effective, but at least we're getting some treatments for these particular viruses. Luckily for us, Marburg and Ebola are not found around here. They're predominantly found in Africa, and they really have been starting to have an increase in number of Ebola especially just in the last few years. So it has been making the news. It has been making the news just because it's becoming more of an epidemic in these areas. Anyone that works with this virus has to be in that full biosafety level number four and have your own oxygen supply. I mean, everything is covered so it does not get in the body. Again, the biggest outbreaks we're having are over in Africa. The United States has had a few cases and even death from Ebola. Those were from traveling nurses, though, that had picked it up while in Africa and then brought it back and were diagnosed. It's not common here in the United States. Another concept check for which disease 
are both active and passive immunization given at the same time. And that's that rabies. Again, it's we give that antibody at the bite site, and then you're also given a vaccine. And the only reason you can give in a vaccine after exposure is because that rabies virus is so slow to replicate. Now, we're going to move on to our next group. So we already got through all of our enveloped negative strand of the single-stranded RNA. Now we're going to get onto our enveloped and positive strand of single-stranded RNA. And, yes, we get into the coronaviridae group as well as togaviridae and flaviviridae groups. So, the big one, coronaviruses. Now, coronaviruses have been around for a long time. Only recently has it become part of, you know, a conversation in your house is because of COVID-19, which is a new deadly strain of coronavirus. However, coronaviruses have been around for a very long time. Now, where it gets its name, coronaviruses all have these nice evenly spaced spikes on the outside of it. Now, the word corona means crown, if you didn't know that. So these little spikes on the outside, they say resemble a crown of spikes around the outside of the virus itself. There are lots of different coronaviruses. There are a lot of coronaviruses that infect animals, including pets, but there are five types of coronaviruses that have been hanging out for a long time affecting human diseases. And what they cause is some things you've probably already had. There are coronaviruses that cause the common cold. Now there are different strains of coronavirus that can cause the common cold, but coronaviruses can cause the common cold. So if you've had the common cold, you've probably had a coronavirus. Now, you know, don't freak out. Everyone's like, oh my God, I've had a coronavirus. Yeah, you haven't had COVID-19. That's a completely, you know, specific strain of a coronavirus. If you've had the common cold, you had the common cold. It's different than COVID-19, different signs and symptoms. Now there are coronaviruses that can cause viral pneumonia. They can cause myocarditis. Some do affect the intestines and they cause enteric, so you're vomiting diarrhea. And then there are some that can cause what's known as severe acute respiratory syndrome, which we call SARS. They are transmitted airborne, and the ones that can cause severe acute respiratory syndrome, depending on the strain, they can be 9% fatality rates, depending on the strain. Now, the ones that do cause this respiratory syndrome are generally spread by respiratory droplets. Some of these symptoms may sound kind of familiar, with COVID. We still don't know a lot about COVID. I mean, we know a lot more now than we did even months ago. However, we don't know everything. But yeah, COVID seems to cause some pneumonia symptoms. It has been known to cause myocarditis. It's been known to cause digestive issues. It's been known to cause respiratory distress. And we know it's in this coronavirus family, so it's not uncommon that would cause these particular symptoms. The SARS, the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, there are different strains of SARS. But in 2002, we did have kind of our first deadly strain of a SARS virus. It was spread through droplets. It was spread through direct contact. It caused fever, body aches, malaise. But for some individuals, it did cause respiratory distress. It caused your respiratory system to not get enough oxygen for survival. The stars that was emerging around 2002 was predominantly found in China. And so if you remember 2002 or the early 2000s, I remember 2002 in the early 2000s. But if you remember, I'm like, a lot of the news was talking about this particular virus because it was found predominantly in China. And so all the pictures, all the news broadcasts, everything about this virus in China, everyone in China was wearing a mask. And guess what? The virus did eventually kind of go away. It's not because we had a vaccine, and we're not sure. Maybe it was because they were so great with wearing masks. It did kind of start to go away. It's still out there. There are still cases of it. Our very own COVID-19 resembles the SARS, that, that SARS strain that came about in 2002. It doesn't to be, seem to be quite as deadly as that particular strain, 
Uh, the only treatment we had for SARS is just supportive. There was inflammation, inflammatory. If there's a fever, something to lower the fever. Don't have a vaccine even yet for a 2002 virus. So that's my note. I'm like, they've been working on a virus. I don't think there's the push to get a vaccine for this particular strain, just because there's not as many cases as there is for COVID-19. So more cases, more push for a vaccine, more money for a vaccine, um, as they're still working on a vaccine for the strain in 2002. This is kind of where I want to go into COVID. However, I've got a whole different PowerPoint for COVID. And so you'll notice, this is kind of my preview to it, COVID is a SARS virus and it's a coronavirus. It's kind of where the, the official name of COVID comes from. But it's one of those, we're going to come back to it. It's going to come back as a separate PowerPoint because I didn't want to add that into this. We got enough other viruses to go through. COVID's going to be its own separate PowerPoint. The other, so we have coronavirus as its own separate group. Now we're on to the Tolgaviridae and the Flaviviridae is still in this enveloped positive sense single-stranded RNA section. Of the Tolgaviruses and the Flaviviruses, a lot of them are what are known as arboviruses, which I'll tell you what an arbovirus is, but not all of them. So we're going to go through a couple that aren't arboviruses first. The first one that's in the Tolgavirus group, but it's not an arbovirus, is rubella. So the virus name itself is rubavirus. It causes rubella, but it's more commonly known as German measles. It is also spread through respiratory secretions. We can diagnose this particular virus doing various types of serological or antibody or antigen testing. There really isn't any specific treatment. The major signs and symptoms that it causes is a widespread rash over the whole body, fever, sore throat, body aches. Most individuals recover without any long-lasting problems. However, to avoid it altogether, we do have a vaccine. Now we're on the last part of MMR vaccine that we've gotten through measles, we've gotten through mumps, and now we've got the rubella. And since we've developed the vaccine, the cases have gone way down. But again, we're still seeing some cases for those that have chosen not to vaccinate. Again, most people recover without any issues with this particular virus. Everyone's like, why do I need to vaccinate? Won't kill me. Ah, it might not kill you. It's not something that's generally going to kill you, cause you even long-lasting effects. However, if you're a pregnant woman, or if you're a male, and you're around someone that's a pregnant female, and that pregnant female picks up this particular virus, that's when it can cause serious issues. If you're an adult, generally, you don't have any long-lasting issues. So it's called postnatal rubella. That means it's after birth. Oh, you've got that sore throat, tired, or rash. It all goes away. However, pregnant women, if they pick up this particular virus, if the mom has it, baby's got it too. This is a virus that can cross the placental barrier. Most viruses cannot cross the placental barrier. If a pregnant female gets the flu, baby does not have a flu. However, if a pregnant female gets rubella, baby's got rubella, and that's not good. So if the infection happens, if, they, if rubella is picked up in that first trimester, it's most likely going to cause miscarriages, and it's going to suffer the more severe side effects. Baby's going to have cardiac or heart abnormalities. They're going to have um, ocular lesions, which can cause blindness. It can cause deafness. This particular virus is the number one cause of deafness in newborns. It can cause mental disabilities. It can cause physical disabilities. So this is a virus that a healthy adult shouldn't have to really worry that much about. However, getting vaccinated is really for protection for any female that's pregnant or anyone that's going to be around a female that's pregnant. It's so that those pregnant females don't pick up this virus and don't spread it uh, to that unborn child. Our next virus, it's in the flavivirus group, and it's still not an arbovirus, is the hepatitis C. This is spread by body secretions. 
So it's usually picked up through some type of blood contact, whether it's blood transfusions, needle sharing, um, but it's picked up, yes, usually by blood contact somehow. Infections have a lot of different characteristics for this particular virus. A lot of people, when I say a lot, 75 to 85% not have any symptoms and generally maintain this virus in their body for their entire lifetime. However, some, we're going to have some type of chronic liver disease and that's about it. But again, any kind of inflammation to your liver, any kind of damage to your liver does put you at an increased risk of developing cancer of that particular organ. So this virus really does like to stay with individuals that have picked it up. Now, treatment. We're getting new treatments all the time for hepatitis C. And because it's a virus that really does like to stay with individuals, even for an entire lifetime, a lot of our treatments are antivirals that are trying to prevent the virus from reproducing. And we are getting quite a few drugs on the market that are keeping that virus pretty much dormant. It doesn't kill the virus, but it keeps it dormant to the point it's not spreading. And there are some individuals that have kept that virus dormant long enough that the immune system has even been able to come around and knock out any remaining viruses. So we do have some treatments for this particular virus. We don't have a vaccine for it. It's mostly just a treatment to try to get rid of it. Now, the arboviruses that are in these group of the toga and the flaviviridae, an arbovirus just mean a virus that's spread by arthropods, aka insects. So it's any virus that can be spread by insect. So whether that's mosquitoes, ticks, flies, gnats, lice, whatever it is. And there's well over 400 viruses that are spread by insects. So more things to worry about. And a lot of the viruses that are spread by insects are in the Togo virus group, the flavoviruses group, and there's also some bunyoviruses and some rheoviruses. Most of the illnesses cause mild fevers. But some can cause more severe encephalitis, the inflammation of the brain, and some can cause life-threatening hemorrhagic fever. The good news for us is they're spread by insects. And so they tend to be clustered in more tropical regions or subtropical regions, so areas around the equator. So although you may not like winter around this area, you don't like snow, you don't like freezing temperatures, kills a lot of insects. And so we tend up here in the upper Midwest not to have a lot of arboviruses. We have them, but because a lot of insects can't survive winter, we have less of them. So, you know, one good thing to celebrate when it gets really cold in the winter is that it is killing insects. So, yay for that. Now, some of the arbovirus infections that are found here in the United States, one of them is West Nile virus. It causes an encephalitis. We do find it here in the upper Midwest. It's spread by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes generally pick it up by infected birds and even infected horses. And so it happens occasionally in the summer. You may try to listen for it now that sometimes in the news, they seem to get all concerned if they all of a sudden find a whole bunch of dead birds somewhere. Well, it's, this virus can kill the birds that it has infected. And if you have infected birds, mosquitoes are biting the birds and then biting us. And so there is that possible source of infection to us. So it's why they care if birds are dying, is they're going to test them for West Nile to see, you know, do we have a lot of the virus in the area? Is it something we need to be more concerned about for any particular sum summer? About 80% of people that pick up this virus don't even show any symptoms. And you're not spreading it to anyone else. It's not a contagious disease because it's only spread by the bite of a mosquito. About 20% are going to show some viral type symptoms, fever, fatigue, muscle aches, kind of just some flu-like symptoms. And then about less than 1% develop neurological illnesses where they can develop encephalitis, they can develop meningitis. It can be deadly. 
you may have known someone that's had West Nile, um, meaning they were probably in the 20% where they had the symptoms and maybe it developed into encephalitis or meningitis as well. Some other ones around here, Colorado tick fever, Eastern equine encephalitis, that one specifically comes from infected horses, our very own lacrosse encephalitis. There's a St. Louis encephalitis. Oh, if I can say this right, the chikungunya virus. There we go. Uh, it's more Caribbean, so more if you're going to a tropical, warmer climate. And then the Zika virus, which has been more in the news. And the Zika virus is found in the United States right now, just in Florida. But who knows? Climate change. Maybe it'll come further north. Uh, it is spread by mosquitoes, and luckily the particular mosquito that this virus hangs out in could not survive freezing temperatures. So if you're traveling to areas, warm, warm tropical climates, you are at a higher risk of picking it up. But luckily here in the upper Midwest, we don't have to worry about the Zika virus here. As I said before, a lot of these arboviruses cause kind of fever inflammation. However, some of them can develop into hemorrhagic fevers. One particular one is called yellow fever. Now, luckily, we've eliminated the virus that causes yellow fever here in the United States. And we knew that it was spread by humans to mosquitoes. We also knew that there were cycles where it was spread between monkeys and mosquitoes. And we've eliminated it because we have a vaccine for it. And we've also eliminated the mosquito vectors that were carrying this particular virus. The virus itself can cause your kind of flu-like symptoms, a headache, fever, muscle ache, but it can develop into oral hemorrhaging or bleeding in the mouth. It can cause nosebleeds, vomiting, jaundice, liver, kidney damage, and it can have a pretty high death rate. So it can be deadly. Luckily, again, not here, but if you were traveling somewhere to a more tropical climate, there, you know, you should double check to see if they do have yellow fever there and you can get vaccinated before you travel. Another fever that's spread by insects is the dengue fever. It's in the Flavivirus group. Uh, we don't find it here in the United States, so one we don't have to worry about unless you travel. But this particular virus can cause what's known as the dengue hemorrhagic shock syndrome. It's not the first time you get bitten by a mosquito with this particular virus. It's the second time that causes the biggest issues. The first time you get bitten by this particular virus, your immune system recognizes the virus, it develops antibodies, it's, it does what it's supposed to do. However, the second time you pick up this particular virus, you have antibodies that are there to do their job. But your immune system can actually get a little over hyperactive and have an excessive or kind of a crazy response to this particular virus. The antibodies and the, the inflammation that your immune system can cause can actually cause your extreme fevers, can cause drastic blood pressure changes, and it's your immune system's response which will actually kill you because it can develop the extreme fevers, that blood pressure changes that can actually be fatal. Luckily, we don't have it around here. So unless you're traveling somewhere tropical, don't have to worry about it. All of these arboviruses are spread by insects. So the number one way to prevent yourself from getting an arbovirus, including our own lacrosse encephalitis, is to prevent yourself from getting bitten by insects, whether it's mosquitoes or flies or gnats and, or ticks. It's in the summer, making sure you've got some type of mosquito control. If you're going to be out at dusk, make sure you've got bug spray on with DEET. You've got long clothing that covers your skin. You have bed nets on your bed if, on your beds if you're outside and you know you, this you know virus is around you know it's anything to control the insect population it's going to decrease your chance of picking up one of these arboviruses another concept check question rubella is a serious infection for both children and adults well it's true children are generally going to suffer some more severe side effects but rubella can affect both children and adults on to our next group. It's my little green group here. These all have an envelope. They all have the positive stand of single-stranded RNA, just like these. The only difference is, is this group, they have an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. Again, most enzymes end in ACE, 
And based on its name, reverse transcriptase, it is an enzyme that can do reverse transcription. We call the family of viruses that have this structure the retroviruses or the retroviridae group. Reverse transcription means it does transcription in reverse. Retro means backwards. And so it's the retroviridae because these things are doing something backwards. There are a couple groups of, I'm gonna go back, a couple groups in the retroviridae group. There's the oncogenic viruses and the immunosuppressive retroviruses. We're gonna first talk about the immunosuppressive retroviruses. And they're the ones that you probably hear about most because these are the viruses that cause damage to the immune system. It's the human immunodeficiency virus. So this particular virus was first discovered in the early 1980s in the United States. So we're not sure where it came from because the first case of this virus, the first documented case was 1959. So, you know, where was it before that? Where did it come from if we first noticed it in 1959? So we first discovered it here in the early 1980s. And this particular virus causes your immune system to collapse. So you have a deficient immune system, which means your immune system cannot do its job. That's when you have developed what's known as acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It means you've acquired an immune system that's deficient. And we shortened acquired immunodeficiency syndrome to AIDS. Because your immune system cannot do its job, individuals die from this virus. And it's not the virus that kills you, it's the fact that your immune system does not work. And all of a sudden you develop disorders that only those that have no working immune system would pick up. And so one example is a severe pneumonia caused by a fungus called pneumocystis gyrovetsi. You might develop a rare cancer of the blood vessels called Kaposi sarcoma but you're probably gonna have some type of sudden weight loss, swollen lymph nodes, and just your general loss of immune function. As I said before, it's a retrovirus. So it has an enzyme reverse transcriptase, so it can do transcription in reverse. So kind of going through how that looks on here. So here's the single strand of RNA, and here's the reverse transcriptase, the big blue blob. Well, this particular enzyme is going to take that single strand of RNA and it's going to bring in DNA bases to make the opposite strand. So, for example, if there was an A on the RNA strand, reverse transcription would bring in a T, not a U. It brings in a T because it's bringing in the DNA bases. If there was a C on the RNA, it would bring in a G like normal but it's bringing in the DNA bases. So it's gonna make, now my purple strand, the single-stranded DNA. It made a copy of the RNA. Well, it wants double-stranded DNA. So that same enzyme reverse transcriptase is gonna finish it up and it's gonna make the opposite complementary strand of that first strand of DNA and all of a sudden we have double-stranded DNA from a single-stranded RNA. It did transcription in reverse. Normal transcription takes double-stranded DNA and makes a copy into a single-stranded RNA. Well, this takes a single-stranded RNA and in the end makes double-stranded DNA. We now have a double-stranded DNA, viral DNA. We and our cells have double-stranded DNA. So it becomes seamless that this viral double-stranded DNA can permanently become integrated into our double-stranded DNA. The structure of the virus itself, it does have its genetic material on the inside. However, it's these outside glycoproteins. It's glycoprotein GP120 and glycoprotein GP41. It's these very specific glycoproteins on the outside surface of the virus that target and recognize very specific cells in our body. They recognize specifically white blood cells and even more specifically helper T cells. 
So they don't infect any other cells. They're not going to infect skin cells, any of our di- you know, cells in our respiratory tract, our digestive tract. They target T helper cells because of those very specific glycoproteins. There are two strains of HIV, HIV-1 and HIV-2. HIV-1 strain is found here in the United States and mostly in Europe, where the HIV-2 strain is found more in Africa. They both do the same thing. Just know that they are genetically different, but they both do the same thing. They recognize RT helper cells because they are looking specifically for markers or receptors on the CD4, the T helper cells, And I'm like, they're recognizing that specific receptor on those cells. Now, how it's picked up. Transmission happens by either direct or specific route. So it's usually picked up through sexual uh, intercourse or transfer of blood or blood products. And that really is because semen and blood contain the highest concentration of virus. So a highest concentration of virus, which means it's the most infective fluids. Breast milk can also include enough virus that it can cause infections in babies that are nursing with infected breast milk. Good news is that HIV itself does not survive long outside the body, so it is a direct contact with bodily fluids. Now, HIV is the sixth most common cause of death among people in the age groups of 25 to 44 in the United States. And men account for about 75% of all new infections. And that is because of that really high concentration of the virus in semen. So it is spread in both hetero and homosexual males. HIV drug users can also be big HIV carriers as it can be spread by sharing needles. In 2009, the number of infected individuals worldwide that still have this virus are about 35 million. And in the United States, we have over a million here infected with this particular virus. That means, yes, even here in Wisconsin, we have people that are infected with HIV. It is found in every state in the United States. When it gets inside, that virus attaches to one of our T helper cells. It gets inside, it gets its RNA in, it makes its DNA, it makes the double-stranded DNA, It gets inside of our nucleus where our double-stranded DNA is. It integrates with our DNA. And we now have our very own cells that contain viral double-stranded DNA, which means our cells are hijacked. And our cells have now the ability to reproduce viruses. We'll start to be able to read the DNA. We'll start to make proteins. They're going to start to make the protein coat. They're going to start to make copies of the RNA and they're gonna get assembled and released. Now the stages of an HIV infection. After an initial infection, usually takes a couple weeks after infection before symptoms show up. And the symptoms are mononucleosis or mono-like symptoms that appear and then they disappear just as quickly. It usually shows up as an inflamed spleen, achy, tired, sore throat, swollen lymph nodes. And that really is because in that first couple weeks, you're going to have an increase of the virus in the body. And you're going to get that initial infection. But then they do disappear. A lot of the symptoms will go away on their own. And the number of viruses in the body do actually decrease. They don't go away though, but they decrease. And part of that is your immune system is recognizing that you're under attack and it is keeping some of the virus under control. It's getting rid of some of the virus, but not all of it. And a lot of individuals will then go into an asymptomatic phase for two, even up to 15 years. And during that 10 to 15 years, the virus is going to slowly start to increase and the number of your white blood cells is going to slowly decrease. So this is all happening while asymptomatic. It means your body's under attack. Now, when you develop what's known as AIDS, you're in this last stage, it's when your T helper cells, your T4 white blood cells, fall below 200 per milliliter. It means you now you don't have enough of them to fight any kind of battle if you do get infected with some type of disease. 
Now it's usually, you're also gonna have some, you know, extreme fever, swollen lymph nodes, diarrhea, weight loss. You're gonna possibly have some neurological symptoms. You're gonna have those opportunistic infections that don't affect others that have healthy immune systems. You might start to develop some of the more rare cancers. And I'm like, all of these are gonna happen when that CD4 white blood cell count gets low enough. Now, testing and diagnosis. So the initial screening is they're gonna look for antibodies. We're generally looking for antibodies right away. And they're gonna run an ELISA. Because again, you can run like 96 different individuals on one plate for ELISA screening and looking for anyone that has HIV antibodies. And it happens that positives are gonna show up. That doesn't mean a person has HIV, the virus itself active in the body. Let me give you an example why. Because I've known people that this has happened. They've had a false positive. Now, false positive means they don't have HIV, they don't have the virus, but they showed up positive for having antibodies. It does happen. This virus is out there in the United States, in every single state. However, you do need enough. You still need a high enough viral load to get that infectious dose requirement to actually develop and harbor the virus itself permanently. It could happen that at some point going throughout your daily life, it's somewhere you've been exposed to the virus, but maybe just a few viruses. Not enough to cause an infection, but enough to trigger your immune system to recognize it and develop some antibodies against it. Not enough antibodies that would make you immune. I should point that out. But some antibodies might be present in the body that would show up on an ELISA. It doesn't mean they have the virus itself. It just means at some point in their life, they were exposed to a small enough dose that developed a few antibodies against it. If that happens that there is a positive for antibodies, they then follow it up with a Western blot test. Then they're going to look for the antigens of the virus, looking specifically to see, is the virus present in the body? That's going to be the, con the confirmation. That takes longer. It's more expensive. They're always going to do the ELISA first as that first screening. Diagnosing to say someone is, is in that AIDS stage of HIV progressive uh, progression is, one, you have to be positive for the virus. You have to have the virus there. But you also have to have one of these other criteria. You have to have that very low CD4 white blood cell count. Your CD4 cells need to be fewer than 14% of all your white blood cells or all of the lymphocytes. And possibly you're experiencing one or more of a CDC provided list of AIDS defining illnesses, such as that Kaposi's sarcoma, the pneumonia caused by that pneumocystis gyrovetsi. Some of those illnesses that are so rare, they only affect those that don't have a working immune system. Then they'll say that someone is in the AIDS stage of HIV progression. Preventing and treatment. We do not have a vaccine. So they recommend monogamy, condoms, universal precautions in the healthcare, making sure PPE is worn, making sure blood is tested before any kind of transfusion. We have in there no cure. It's true, we don't have a cure. However, we do have enough drugs and therapies now that we can slow the progression of the disease so that you're almost cured. <laughs> it's, it doesn't mean that if you've got the virus, it will go away, but we can keep the virus from replicating and causing damage. So people can still generally lead a normal life as long as they're taking those antiviral therapies and it's usually a handful of drugs taken for the rest of your life. We do also now have drugs that have come out just in the last year that are called HIV PrEP drugs, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. These particular drugs, it's not a vaccine because it's not working how a vaccine does. You gotta take them every day and you take it if you know you're gonna be at a high risk of picking up this particular virus. And it prevents the establishment of the virus. It prevents this particular virus from getting in those CD4 cells and ever taking hold. So it's prevention only, but it has to be taken every day 
for the rest of your life whenever you, you know, if you think you're at a high risk of picking up this particular virus. So we don't have a cure because we can't get rid of the virus if you have it, but we can keep that virus at bay. The other group of retroviruses have that reverse transcriptase enzyme. They do target the immune system, but they don't cause full destruction of the immune system like HIV did. Instead, these particular viruses cause cancer. So they're oncogenic viruses. One of them is called the human T-cell lymphotropic virus. So it's affecting specifically the T-cells, white blood cells, and it causes a cancer known as leukemia. Luke means white, and so leukemia is a cancer of your white blood cells. So these are a leukemia. It's acquired. You're not born with this particular leukemia, this particular cancer disorder. And there are two strains of the human T-cell lymphotropic viruses, one and two. The number one human T-cell lymphotropic virus one, as it gets in and infects our T-cells, it causes the T-cells to become damaged and actually look different than they should. That the outside of it becomes more of a distorted looking T-cells. Some say they're even called a hairy T-cell. So these are T-cells that are infected. These are not normal T-cells. They don't normally have all this kind of wrinkliness to it. And so they're damaged T-cells. That usually presents itself on the outside with um, a dermatitis. You're going to have kind of scaly ulcerative skin lesions. Now, the human T lymphotrophic virus 2, it's a close relative, and I'm like, we know it can cause damage to our T cells, but we don't have a specific disease that it causes. Now, we know it's there, we know it exists, we just don't have a specific disease yet. We just know it causes some damage to T cells. We're just not sure the extent of the damage and how it's unique from anything else. On to our next group. So we're on to our naked, positive sense, single-stranded RNA. So these do not have an envelope. Now, there are three groups on here. The Picornoviridae group, there are lots of viruses in this particular group. Uh, there's also the Hepavirus, the Calisoviridae, and the Astroviridae group. We're going to focus most of our time, because there are the most of them, on the Bicornoviridae group. The Bicornoviridae group are named for their small size. Pico means small. So if you play the piccolo, it means a small flute. So the Bicornoviruses are some of the smallest human viruses that cause disease. In this group, we kind of have subgroups or different genera. And we have our enteroviruses, we have rhinoviruses, and we have some cardioviruses. Now, the cardioviruses are rare, so we're not going to talk about them. Just know, again, there are viruses out there that we're not going to talk about, just like there's bacteria out there that we don't talk about, too. We're going to talk about the most common. So we're going to focus right away on some of the enteroviruses and the rhinoviruses. They're called enteroviruses, not because they cause damage to the intestine, because entero means intestine. It's because enteroviruses are spread, fecal oral. Just my note on fecal oral again. Fecal oral means you eat poop. Again, you're not getting a fork and spoon out, but there's spread fecal oral. There's fecal matter everywhere. And in that fecal matter, this virus can be found. It can be concentrated. And if it gets into your body because you ate some of it in your mouth, um, you can develop some of these viral diseases. So in our enterovirus group, the ones that are all spread fecal oral. We've got our polio virus, we've got some Coxsackie virus, echovirus, um, and then there's even um, our enterovirus 72, which we just call it as our hepatitis A virus. And our first enterovirus that we're going to talk about is the polio virus, which causes disease, poliomyelitis. Now, that in itself is a mouthful, so we generally just shorten it to polio. It's spread fecal oral. It can get into the body through the digestive tract, and then it causes damage to our nervous system, and our nervous system controls our muscular system, so it causes neuromuscular damage. It can lead to paralysis. It can lead to death. The virus itself, again, it 
doesn't have an envelope, so it's naked. It's resistant to acid. It's resistant to bile. It's resistant to detergents. It can survive stomach acids. This thing is hard to kill. Luckily for us, we have a vaccine. If you ask your grandparents, they did not. Well, depending on how old your grandparents are. Um, maybe great-grandparents. This vaccine's not been around, and it's been a very deadly virus. Luckily, we have developed a vaccine, and we've had very good success with high vaccination rates that we are expecting eradication of this particular virus. We don't even have cases here in the United States anymore, but they're out there. There are, st there are still people that suffer from polio in the world. As I said before, it is spread fecal oral, so it gets into the digestive tract, it multiplies, it spread, it shed in feces, it spread fecal oral. You can find the virus in blood as well, but it's mostly spread fecal oral. So some people initially develop kind of mild symptoms, kind of almost cold-like symptoms, fever, headache, nausea, sore throat, muscle aches, nothing too bad. However, if it gets into the nervous system and causes more extensive damage, it can cause muscle pain. It can cause muscle spasms. It can cause meningeal inflammation. Again, it is damaging the nervous system. And because the nervous system controls your skeletal muscles, it's also causing issues with your muscles. If you no longer can control your muscles because of that neurological damage, it causes what's known as flaccid paralysis. It's because of that damage to your nervous system controlling those muscles. Now, even if you survived polio, you were paralyzed for a while, um, a lot of individuals still are fine. They develop, you know, use of those muscles again. Decades later, you can develop what's known as post-polio syndrome. It's because you still had neurological damage to your nervous system and to the muscles that are controlled by the nervous system, that after time, that neuromuscular junctions do start to deteriorate. And so later on in life, even if you survived polio, thought you were totally fine, later on in life, you end up in wheelchairs or you have to have leg braces because your muscles are deteriorating because of the damage that this virus Caused. A lot of individuals were asymptomatic, and so there were a lot of individuals that were still spreading, like the majority of individuals, asymptomatic, which means could be spreading out without having any idea how, where this particular virus is, how is it getting picked up. The most common muscles that were affected by this were the muscles of the legs, muscles of the abdomen, the back, the intercostal muscles, the diaphragm, the pectoral girdle, and even the bladder. Because of the damage to the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles, if you can't control your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles, it means you can't breathe. You breathe because of pressure differences caused by volume as you control the volume breathing in and breathing out. However, if you can't control those muscles to change the volume, which changes the air pressure, you don't breathe in and out. And you develop something known as bulbar myelitis. This is when they would have to put individuals into what they call as iron lungs. This is an actual picture of the iron lung children's ward before we had a vaccine. And children were the number one group of individuals that pick up this virus. It's spread fecal oral. You have to admit, kids are pretty dirty. They don't always wash their hands all the time. Everything goes in their mouth. And I'm like, so they were the number one group of individuals picking it up. They would put you in these things called iron lungs. And they did the job of what your muscles did, your diaphragm and in your costals. So they would increase the pressure inside the tube. And that air pressure in the tube would push down on you and cause air to exhale. And then they could change the pressure right away so they would decrease it. So it would actually cause your lungs to inflate and air to go in. And so they did exactly what your muscles are meant to do. 
So as the tube increased and decreased pressure constantly, it was causing that pressure on your, your rib cage to change that volume, to change the pressure, allowed you to breathe in and out. Most children still recovered from this. Not all, most children still recovered and were able to survive outside of the lung. There are still people that live in the iron lung though. So it's most recovered fine, but there are still people that still need that iron lung to breathe because of that damage to their respiratory system. Now, treatment and prevention. So treatment was generally supportive. We really didn't have a lot of treatments out there. The biggest thing that happened was prevention is that we got a vaccine. So Jonah Salk, who is in, has his, a whole institute called the Salk Institute named after him, Jonah Salk was the one that developed the first vaccine. It was an inactivated vaccine, but it was still pretty effective. So it was given by a shot. Well, about six, seven years later, Carl, Carl Sabin came along and developed a live oral vaccine. It was an attenuated vaccine, and it was attenuated, which means it was damaged. It was made to be inactive. It couldn't cause the virus itself. And because it was oral, parents liked it better. No kid likes to get shots. But because it was attenuated, it was still a living virus, even though damaged, there was an instance in Europe in the early 1990s where this attenuated virus mutated and became infective. And so there was a group of individuals that had gotten this vaccine and had actually developed polio from it. No one had died. However, because there is that slight, slight risk of a mutation here in the United States, we do not give the oral live polio vaccine. So there, we're pretty close. We're trying to get a worldwide eradication to happen. If enough people get vaccinated, it means they can't spread the polio. And if we can get to a point where no one has polio, the virus will die out. Because the only way it sticks around is if someone has it and someone's spreading it. What's made the news in the last couple years is that there has been a polio-like illness that has come forth is that children, and it seems to only be children, children have developed a symptom known as, I'm going to say acute flaccid myelitis. It means all of a sudden they have no control over some of their muscles, meaning there's damage to their muscles or damage to the nervous system that controls the muscles. And the scary thing is, is we don't know exactly what's causing it. And part of that is by the time a child comes in and has symptoms, the virus itself seems to be gone. The immune system has gotten rid of the virus, but the, you know, kind of the leftover symptoms, the damage that was done is still prevalent. But if the virus is there, you can't really isolate it and identify it. They do, however, still think it's in the group of these enteroviruses, that the same kind of enterovirus that causes polio another strain of enteroviruses is causing this acute flaccid myelitis. So we've seen cases just in the last couple of years, a few random cases kind of all over the United States in random rare places. I know there was one in Minnesota um, and they're just not sure exactly what virus it is, where it's coming from. Again, most people that had even polio or asymptomatic, we're not we're not sure if they're just a lot of asymptomatic carriers and just the occasional person is getting it. We're not even sure exactly what virus it is. We just think it's some type of enterovirus. But we'll see if that starts to make the news. I'm guessing it'll make the news once COVID starts to die out and we'll kind of go back to some of these other mystery viruses. Now, some non-polio enteroviruses, because polio is a big enterovirus. The most common are the Coxsackie viruses, and there are two big groups, A and B. They are named because they were discovered in a city called Coxsackie, New Jersey. Um, and then there's echoviruses. An echovirus, it gets kind of its unique name. It stands for enterocytopathic human orphan. It just means it was a virus. We didn't know what it caused. So it was an orphan virus. Of, oh, we know it causes damage to cells. 
We don't know anything more than that. So it's an orphan with, it's a virus without a disease. Well, the Coxsackie A and B viruses and the echo viruses, um, they can still cause some similar symptoms to polio and how they're spread. There's all enteroviruses and some of the initial characteristics, some of the fever, the tired, the fatigue, but they're less virulent. They're less likely to cause disease. They're less likely to cause severe disease. They are responsible for a lot of respiratory infections, a lot of pink eyes, so a lot of viral pink eyes. So none of that crusty, goopy stuff, that's bacterial pink eye, but just if your eyes are very pink, conjunctivitis. And a more common known one too, if you've ever had kids or you know anyone that's got kids, is the hand, foot, and mouth disease is a Coxsackie virus. So there are some rare cases of these viruses that can cause more severe side effects like paralysis, meningitis, or encephalitis. But most often they cause kind of cold-like respiratory infections, pink eye, hand, foot, and mouth disease. So if you know anyone that's had any of those, um, Coxsackie viruses, and it's just kind of a fun name. And the last of our enteroviruses is the, hep of the hepatitis virus. It's a unique hepatitis because all other hepatitises are spread by some type of bodily fluid. So blood transfusion. Um, this is spread by fecal oral. So more you eat poop type of um, spread. They are resistant to heat. They are resistant to acid, so they are harder to kill. They can survive for longer periods of time. A lot of individuals are asymptomatic, which means they can be carriers of the disease. And this particular virus, it's spread fecal oral, so it gets into the intestine. It can then get into the bloodstream and goes to the liver. It causes more flu-like symptoms. It is a hepatitis, so it can cause some damage to the liver, causing inflammation of the liver. It generally doesn't cause enough damage to the liver that jaundice is present. Instead, it's more flu-like symptoms, but it's still a hepatitis. There is no specific treatment. Most recover uh, without any long-lasting effects to the liver. However, we do have a vaccine, so you can vaccinate against hepatitis. Also, because it's spread fecal oral, you know, if you're not vaccinating, good hygiene is also another way to prevent this particular virus. Another concept check, uh, poliomyelitis is generally acquired how? Well, it's acquired by ingestion, fecal oral, you eating poop. Now, another virus that it's guaranteed you have all picked up this particular virus in your lifetime. Like, you've all had a human rhinovirus. It's because the rhinovirus, there are more than 110 types in the rhinovirus group, and they are all associated with the common cold. So if you've had the common cold, it's most likely a rhinovirus. Who knows, it could have been a coronavirus, it could have been a dental virus. There's lots of viruses that cause the common cold, but the rhinovirus is the number one cause of the common cold. Now, because there are so many unique surface markers, it's going to make a vaccine very unlikely. And they're all changing, and so it's unlikely we're ever going to develop a vaccine. So there's lots of strains that are always circulating in the population at any time, we generally pick it up from contaminated hands touching inanimate objects, and then it gets into the mouth or touching your eyes or your nose. So anytime you're touching a possibly contaminated doorknob or a phone or a desk or a chair, you know, any object that you touch could have this virus on it. And then if you touch your eyes, your nose, or your mouth, this virus gets in the body. Again, good hygiene, constantly washing your hands, not touching your face, not touching those body surfaces um, on your face will decrease your chance of picking up the virus. So it is hard to kill. It can survive out in the environment uh, for a good amount of time. The interesting part about rhinoviruses is they actually reproduce and kind of spread more easily at a lower than body temperature. So they like 33 degrees Celsius the best. They'll grow at 37 degrees body temperature, 
but they prefer 33 degrees. And so they really like to get into the upper respiratory tract, specifically the nose, which is a little lower than normal body temperature. And this is when you develop some of those upper respiratory symptoms, the headache, the chills, fatigue, sore throat, cough, and a lot of nasal drainage. The only treatment is treating the symptoms. You know, you can treat for coughs. We've got cough medicine over the counter. We've got things to reduce nasal drainage. But your best pet for prevention is just hand washing. I was going to say good hygiene, care in handling nasal secretions. So once you blow your nose, make sure that dirty Kleenex ends up in the garbage can and then wash your hands again. Another in our group of non-enveloped, non-segmented, single-stranded RNA virus are the Calissa viruses. It's also where we find the astroviruses. So they're kind of both in here. They call them astro because they think they look like little stars. Um, but the Calissa viruses and astroviruses, the two together are believed to cause one third of all viral gastroenteritis cases. Now gastroenteritis, this is your vomiting and diarrhea. So if you've ever suffered from vomiting and diarrhea and know it's caused by a virus, pretty good chance it's a calissivirus or an astrovirus. This is also the group that we find noroviruses, which are more commonly known as the cruise ship virus. Because on a cruise ship, you have a lot of people in very close quarters with each other. Everyone's touching the same surfaces, may not be washing your hands all the time, and you're touching the same railings, the same doors, just a breeding ground for spreading this particular virus. It can cause an infection at any age. It doesn't only affect young. It doesn't only affect elderly. It can affect any age group equally. And it's going to cause your na nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, chills. Now, luckily, recovery happens pretty quickly in about, you know, three, four days and a complete recovery. But if you booked a seven-day cruise and you spent three or four days of it in the bathroom, it's not exactly how you want to spend your vacation. The last of our viruses in this group is the hepatitis E. It's also spread fecal-oral. It's an enteric hepatitis is it usually doesn't cause any big issues. Yay! I mean, it's a hepatitis. It can cause inflammation of the liver, but no lasting effects. The only group of individuals that suffer any kind of severe issues with this particular virus are pregnant women. That is actually fatal in 20% of pregnant women. Every, every other person, totally fine. Pregnant women, it can be fatal. They think it's due to the increase in hormone levels. That increase in hormone levels actually causes the virus to become more virulent and more deadly. It is self-limiting, which means it does leave the body on its own in feces. And so the best way to prevent getting it is stop the fecal oral transmission is washing hands. Um, you know, that's it. Washing hands, making sure, you know, you're not eating things that fell on the floor, things like that. It's good hygiene. Our last group, and thank you for sticking with me, and it's even the most unique group, is because it has double-stranded RNA. RNA is always single-stranded. Everything up here has single-stranded RNA, except this one little group has double-stranded RNA. So it's, it's unique all in itself. There are two viruses that fall into this group. They're the most well-known. Sorry, this is one of three. It's just one. Um, and it's the real viruses and the rotaviruses. The real viruses cause just cold-like symptoms, some upper respiratory infections, sometimes some enteritis, some vomiting, diarrhea, but nothing too bad. The rotaviruses that are in this group that are also spread, it's fecal oral, can cause extreme diarrhea in infants and children to the point that you may not be able to replace fluids and electrolytes fast enough, that this actually is a deadly virus for a lot of infants. Here in the United States, where you don't have to walk maybe 20 feet and you can find a water source, a drinking fountain, a faucet, a bathroom with a faucet, we have clean water everywhere we go. If you live in developing country and you have to walk two miles and you have extreme diarrhea, you might not be able to replace fluids electrolytes fast enough. 
Now, luckily for us, we have developed a vaccine in the last few years, and so we've decreased the rotavirus numbers. Because for a while there, this rotavirus was so common that they guaranteed that 100% of kids before they went to school had had rotavirus at least once in their life. And it really spread throughout daycares with all the kids and, you know, lots of diarrhea. It was a huge cause of diarrhea in infants before the vaccine. Now, it doesn't mean the vaccine is widely used everywhere in the world. And so those in developing countries or regions of the world still suffer from this particular virus. So thank you. We got through all the RNA viruses. Yes, I do still have a separate COVID presentation because it deserves its own PowerPoint presentation. But thank you for sticking with me through all of these RNA viruses. If you have any questions on them, please send me an email.